All right, I've given you a really, really crazy theory, but you know, you're all used to it by now. But this will be one of my top, uh, one of my top craziest theories, all right? This will make it as one of the top. The one that I probably did about the Georgia Guidestones, that was really interesting about why there are so many of these alien sightings that are happening. You might recall that one. So that was probably my best one or my craziest one, whatever you want to call it. This would probably be uh, one of those top three as well. Anyways, uh, a lot of you have heard about, and it has been a hype online about the red heifer and the sacrifice that's going on in Israel. And you might say, what's the big deal about it? Because it's supposed to be a sign, supposedly, supposedly, like I said, a sign that the Messiah's coming is even sooner. Sacrifices are a big deal to the nation of Israel. And in order for the tribulation to occur, you need the sacrifices to begin. And the red heifer is a very special sacrifice because that's a very rare thing that happened in Israel. It is said, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if I'm recalling this correctly, but it is said that only nine red heifers were sacrificed. Only nine until the destruction of the second temple. That's when the Roman government, the Roman Empire, destroyed the second temple. So then Maimonides, if I'm pronouncing his name right, he's a famous Jewish philosopher, rabbi, pagan, whatever you want to call him. But he's a respected scholar among Jews, and he mentioned that when the tenth red heifer would be sacrificed, that that would be the coming of the Messiah. Now, I don't know how much of that is true or not. However, this is not a new thing. So when people think that when this, when this red heifer is about to be sacrificed, that the rapture is about to occur, again, you have to put, put on the brakes. Now, how many times have we heard about a lot of things about what people said, and then people thought that the rapture was going to be such a date, and they give the year and the exact date and the month. Now, you have to be careful of that because I do believe, don't get me wrong, I do believe in certain signs and factors that would, uh, that would speed, that would more make haste the rapture. So then these are things that we are to watch out for and to realize that because his coming is rushing even closer, we ought to be ready. However, I don't want to put, uh, you don't want to put your all into it and bet this is it. Because this is just one of those things. It's just one of those things that would make haste the rapture. People thought two years ago when <coughs> it spread out everywhere that this was it, that the tribulation uh, started. However, that is not the case. But that doesn't deny the fact that <coughs> is one of those big pivotal factors that's making us see that the tribulation is speeding up its clock. So that's how you should take these events. That's what they believed about the red heifer. And there's a website. I'm going to move this side. Let me know if I'm cut off. Okay. There's a website. It's called the Messianic Bible Project. They're a really big deal. They're big on Zionism. They're big into Judaism. They're big on studying the Messiah and the Jews. And they... They gave a lot of documentations about the third temple, about the red heifer. They researched a lot on this matter, believe it or not. And they have a lot of interesting things to say. Before I cover them, though, I want to give the documentation on Maimonides. He mentioned that the tenth red heifer, like I told you before, would be it. That's when the Messiah would come down. This tenth red heifer, they say, would be sacrificed by the Messiah himself. So Messiah himself would offer this red heifer at his coming. This is documented in Parah Aduma, chapters 3 and 4. What does the Bible say about that? Hebrews chapter 9, Jesus Christ is already considered to be that red animal that's given as a sacrifice. He's already given as a sacrifice, so he doesn't need to sacrifice the tenth red heifer. He is already the animal 
that shed his own blood. That's why it's a bloody religion we call Christianity, right? He was covered red from head to toe. The Bible says he was so scarred or marred that you couldn't even recognize his face. He was already that red animal. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a what? Heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ... He's beyond the red heifer here. His red blood, his red sacrifice is beyond the red heifer. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. See, red heifers, they make a big deal about that in Israel, that it's supposed to be without blemish and that it's supposed to be raised in a certain way and that the animal should have certain traits about it. They make a big deal about that without spot. But Jesus Christ is already that animal without spot in verse 14. Without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So Jesus Christ is already that Messiah who sacrificed himself and, uh, in the red heifer's place. So there is no need of that red heifer. However, the Jews, they have this thinking in their mind that what would rush the Messiah's coming is that red heifer. And it is actually true, believe it or not, that tenth red heifer, so to speak, was already given through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Jews, they just see only one coming, but we see two comings of Jesus Christ. His first coming already fulfilled that. His second coming is what the Jews are looking for and expecting. So when this red heifer is being sacrificed, that's a big deal because when we, you look at Daniel chapter 9, go to Daniel 9, sacrifices are reinstated. If you might recall, or if you know this, the Jews, they've stopped animal sacrifices. And it's been going on for centuries. However, the Bible demands that when the tribulation happens and the Antichrist comes down, the sacrifices have to be reinstated. So if the Jews pull out this red heifer when they're doing their sacrifices, that means this is a really big deal because this ain't just a normal lamb sacrifice. They're pulling out their, one of their best, the red heifer. Why would they do something like that? Unless this is so significant and it's rushing God's time clock even sooner for his coming. Look at Daniel chapter 9. And we'll look at verse 27. This is the famous passage about the Antichrist who comes down. And then he makes that covenant. In verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's where you get your seven-year tribulation. And in the midst of the week, in the middle of that seven-year tribulation, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. So notice the Antichrist, he's going to cause a desecration among the sacrifices. Well, how can he cause a desecration among the sacrifices uh, unless you get the sacrifices starting? So that's why we're waiting for those sacrifices to roll. Once those sacrifices roll out, then we know that the Antichrist can come in and put a halt to it and put a desecration on it. As I mentioned before, the Messianic Prophecy Bible Project, they have a lot of interesting articles as they're digging into the third temple because they spend all their time, all their ministry in digging up the Jews and the third temple. Some of the interesting quotes that I'll read from this article, title, the temple vessels are ready for the rebuilding of Jerusalem's third temple. They've, been ha they've had this for quite a long time, believe it or not. They even have a whole museum. The important institute that you want to know is actually the Temple Institute. If you dig up their website, you're going to get everything that you need about the progress of the third temple. Now, you might say, why is this third temple important? And what is the third temple? If I were to review it here, okay, let me move this, that way people can read it. 
The first temple is Solomon when he built this house for the Lord. Now, obviously, that was destroyed at the Babylonian captivity. You'll notice that it's more uh, beautiful in design. And then you'll notice a little bit more poor design. And that is built by Herod, which is called the Second Temple. That was at the timeline of Jesus Christ. It was definitely uh, poor in comparison to Solomon's temple. It was destroyed by the Roman Empire, so the Second Temple was gone. And as you might know, the Jews have been without a temple ever since. The Bible said that there should be sacrifices. In Daniel chapter 9, you already read at verse 27 that there's going to be sacrifices and that he's going to make things desolate. Why? Because there's going to be a temple there. Uh, go to Matthew, um, well, we'll go to 2 Thessalonians 2. That'll be better. 2 Thessalonians 2. The Antichrist, the Bible prophesies, when he comes in, he is going to sit in the temple of God. Wow, that's pretty big. That shows there, which is common sense from Daniel 9, if the Jews are going to have their sacrifices, it would stand to reason they're going to have a temple. You can't have sacrifices without building a temple. All of that is part of the importance of the Jewish rituals and the ordeal as they worship their God. A temple is necessary. So 2 Thessalonians 2 points out the temple is there when the Antichrist comes in. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, verse 3 is the son of perdition. Notice that, son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. Verse 4, the Antichrist opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in where? The temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist needs that temple to be built. That's why everyone is anticipating for the third temple. That's why when you see signs of the Jews preparing their third temple, it's a sign that the tribulation is about to occur. It's a sign that the rapture is about to occur. The Temple Institute, if you look up their website, they pulled up to 25 uh, years of research and craftsmanship, and the Institute has invested in creating the temple treasures. The article continues reading, these are no mere models or replicas. They have been created for use in the third temple, which could possibly be constructed within our lifetime. Every dazzling piece in the Institute's collection is made of pure gold, silver, copper, and other authentic materials. They also mention... They have been crafted only after lengthy research into the designs and practices of the original temple, as required in the Torah and Talmud. Researchers also studied images on ancient coins and other artifacts that survived the Second Temple era, so that they can get an idea of how the design should be done. The Institute relied on dozens of people, rabbis, scholars, scientists, and other experts who contributed their talents to recreate the temple vessels. If you dig it up, they were building the golden altar, the showbread table, jugs for sanctified oil, even the utensils, the golden bowls. They started to build up the high priest uh, ephod and the dressing. They have it all laid out. They have it all laid out. The only thing that's missing is their location, right? They say the Temple Mount was originally where the Jews had their second temple. So if they were to have their third temple, it should be on the Temple Mount. As you might know, the Muslims dominate that site and that area. Because of that, that's the reason why the Jews don't have their third temple built. All you have to do is just put that third temple in there and everything is set. I mean, they got the animal sacrifice set up. They already have the temple decorations. 
the temple vessels and instruments. All they need is that building. Another article from the Messianic Bible Prophecy Project, Israel's priests prepare for the third temple. They're already training priests. This is real big what they're doing. There's a lot of gold mines in this particular article that I don't have time to read. One is from Chaim Richman. He's the director of the Temple Institute. The Temple Institute, quote, is actively engaged in the research and preparation of the resumption of service in the Holy Temple to the extent of actually preparing operational blueprints for the construction of the temple according to the most modern standards. They're already laying projects out on how they're going to build this. The Institute has already created over 60 sacred temple vessels. High priest breastplate containing the 12 precious stones of the tribe of Israel and the musical instruments of the Levitical choir are also ready. They, laid, they, they prepped up, man. They prepped up. Kohen, literally priest, is a status given only to Aaron and his descendant, uh, descendants. These garments will adorn a new generation of Levitical priests who are already in training. Believe it or not, it's been close to 95 years since Jerusalem's chief rabbi Cook was reported in a British publication to have established Torah Koanim. What's that? designed for the training of Levites to serve in a rebuilt temple. They've been doing this almost a century. They're ready. All they need is just that rental room in San Francisco that just won't let them because of building zone codes. <laughs> they just need that. And then they can finally build their, uh, that building. And then, because they've just been longing for it. They've been amping up for it, but somebody just won't let them go yet. You know what I mean, right? If you live in the Bay Area, you kind of know what I'm talking about. That's how hard it is to get a stinking building, man. <laughs> oh. The chief rabbi wrote this. So too the day will come when all nations will recognize the truth of our rights to the temple area. All will know and recognize that the prophetic vision regarding this holy place. There's a lot of different stuff here. In 2010, you know what they did? Uncut stones were collected from the Dead Sea for the construction of the temple altar. Such pristine stones are believed to fulfill the injunction that such building material be free from contact with metal tools. As a matter of fact, believe it or not, the Bible shows that the Dead Sea has a connection with God's temple when he comes down on the earth and rules as king. Didn't you know that? Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47. All right, thank, all right, thank you for letting me know. And by the way, I'm not at the crazy part yet. I'm not at the crazy part yet, okay? All right, Ezekiel chapter 47. I want to wrap up this teaching quickly. Notice that when God starts out with his uh, temple and... There's no doubt that God's going to build his temple when he rules a thousand years at the millennium. Chapter 46 is all the blueprint of the, his temple. Verse, chapter 47, verse 1. Chapter 47, verse 1. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. Rivers are coming out of the temple. Now look at this. It's connected to the Dead Sea here. Look at verse 8, verse 8. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea. What sea is this that God's going to have in his uh, temple in Jerusalem? We know that God will have his temple in Jerusalem at the millennium. So what other sea is the closest? It's that Dead Sea. But if you don't believe it, read about this sea. Keep reading. Which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be what? You know what's uh, one thing you don't know about the Dead Sea? 
supposedly there shouldn't be animal life in there. You know why? That's why they call it the Dead Sea, because of all that salt water. As a matter of fact, if you taste some of that salt water, it could be dangerous to you guys. That's why swimming in that Dead Sea is, you know, you have to take a lot of caution there. But that verse says it's going to be healed. It's going to be healed, right? Look at verse 9. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall what? Live in that Dead Sea. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. Notice that animals can live again in this sea. It's that Dead Sea. The Lord's going to do something with the Dead Sea and His temple. Hey, they're taking uncut stones from the Dead Sea to build this temple. There's some connection right there. The Jews see an importance, they do see an importance of God's temple and the Dead Sea. But what they're building is they're going to build up for the Antichrist. And then God's going to kick out the Antichrist eventually and then take the temple for himself and then heal the waters of the Dead Sea. That's what he's going to be doing. The Third Temple Academy in Mitzpah, Jericho, is about a 20-minute drive from Jerusalem on the road that leads to Jericho and the Jordan Valley. By building a replica of the temple, the school has been able to give the priestly students a hands-on experience of temple sacrificial worship. Wow. Their Kohanim are also being trained to perform the regular temple duties or the daily tamid service that is performed in the holy temple. Despite, uh, here's a quote, despite the limited space and all the typical pressure that accompany first-time efforts, the overall effect was spellbinding as we witnessed a sacred ceremony first described in Torah 4,000 years ago, yet not attended to for 2,000 years of exile, suddenly come to life before our very eyes. All at once, ancient texts and descriptions took shape as today's descendants of Aaron, the first high priest and father of all Kohanim, worked diligently to perform their assigned tasks. This was a, a dress rehearsal that they were doing, and people got to see it. This is really big stuff. As a matter of fact, it's interesting, but then they put a backdrop of the temple over there, so that they can practice what they're going to do in front of this temple. They've, they're really amping things up. They're preparing for purification in the third temple with the red heifer as well. So then uh, there were pre they began a special red heifer breeding program, believe it or not, that includes the implanting of frozen red Angus embryos into domestic Israeli cattle. A crowdfunding campaign is underway to help fund it. Approximately $31,000 have been raised for this effort. They've uh, laid the construction of the temple as well. The six-ton stones have been consecrated with water drawn from the biblical pool of Siloam. So notice they were even laying foundations for the temple. So they couldn't... Uh, put the stone in foundation, so to say, but they have the building material for the foundations ready. Six ton stones consecrated with water drawn from the biblical pool of Siloam. For the last several years, Salomon and his followers have attempted to place these cornerstones on the Temple Mount, but each time they have been stopped by the Israeli police. So they have these stones ready, they just want to put it on there, but every time they go to the Temple Mount, they've been hindered. All they need is just that access. Yep. Then it's pretty much set in place. There's a lot of action going on with the Temple Mount. I would recommend reading this article. It has a lot of interesting details here on what they're doing with the Temple Mount. Believe it or not, with this Temple Mount... It doesn't take much to build a third temple. Don't you know that? It doesn't take much, believe it or not. 
You might say, why is that? Because go to the book of 1 Samuel. Go to the book of 1 Samuel. You don't actually need to make it lavish. You don't actually need to make it difficult to build that third temple. All you need to do is just put a tent. That's it. You might say, no, really? Yeah, believe it or not. All you might need is just a tent and that's it. Look at the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now, remember, the Jews, they didn't have a temple building, right? What did they have? They had a Moses tabernacle, remember? Moses tabernacle, if you might recall in your Bible, is like a tent shape. You remember that? So it's a tent shape. If that's what uh, the tabernacle is called, this tent by the name temple, then already you already have the temple of God that the Antichrist can sit under. What? Really? This tent is called a temple? Yeah. Look at 1 Samuel 3. This is before uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Did I say tree? 1 Samuel chapter 3. Excuse me. 1 Samuel chapter 3. Notice in this tent, Moses' tent, it's called what? Verse 3, And ere the lamp of God went out in the what? Temple. temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Why, they didn't have their temple built, but God called it temple. God called it temple. Just like he calls your body his temple. In God's eyes, he considers it his temple. It can be built with, uh, it can be built with stones, or a body, or a piece of tent flap, but it doesn't matter to him. He considers it his temple. That's big. All they need is just one step, literally just one step on that temple mount. Then boom, perhaps the Antichrist can come in and the tribulation can begin. The rapture can start. That's all it takes, guys. But let me give you something even more interesting than that. There's an article from Israel Today, and they actually say this. They actually say in their title, New Findings Suggest Israel Can Build Third Temple Now by Bert Boersma. You might say, why is that? Because there are some of these people that are saying this. The Temple Mount is not actually where the second temple was supposedly located because there are some contradictions with the statements on how all the Jews crammed inside there and the Roman soldiers conquered it. So there's just uh, differing contra contrary accounts. And in this article, they actually say this. They actually say that the temple where the Jews had it was, believe it or not, at the city of David. The location of the temple is the Gihon Spring, which is situated in the city of David. If that's the case, they can build it now, the article argues. Think about it. They already had the dress rehearsal. They had everything. Any moment now. I could flop a tent over there and then we can start the tribulation or something. That's all it takes. L literally, that's all it takes. If their account is true, that uh, I'm not sure how, uh, I don't know if it's true or false, but what I'm trying to tell you is all these possibilities. And if it is true that the second temple wasn't originally on that temple mount, but at that city of David, somebody, all he needs to do is just set up a tent. That's all the Temple Institute has to do. But the temple mount, that's a traditional, uh, that's a traditional thought, is where the third temple is going to be. And... Israeli lawmakers have been pushing it. This is recently, too. The article that I read to you is recent. This was September 2022. Here's another article at September 2022 from the same source, Israel Today. Title of the article, Time to Build Third Temple, says Israeli lawmaker. It could happen any moment. You know why? The Antichrist is waiting for that covenant. Correct? Title of the article from Axios, Israeli Prime Minister Lapid backs 
two-state solution in UN speech. That covenant made with the Arabs might be faster than you think. This is unheard of. You might, uh, because no one, no Israeli prime minister ever gave such a bold statement like this before, guys. Because remember, Israel wants to claim sovereignty over their territory. They don't want to make a deal with the two-state solution. But now they're, make, they're approving this deal, and the prime minister claims that the majority of Jews are backing up on this. There are other Jews who claim otherwise. But this is really big that a big honcho like him would give a statement like that. He mentions an agreement with the Palestinians based on two states for two peoples is the right thing for Israel's security, for Israel's economy, and for the future of our children. Peace is not a compromise. It is the most courageous decision we can make. Who's pushing peace? The Antichrist, right? Who's the one who would say peace and safety? For right thing for Israel's security, this covenant? That's what the Antichrist is going to do when he slips it in. Despite all the obstacles, still today a large majority of Israelis support the vision of this two-state solution, and I am one of them. Whew. We have only one condition, that a future Palestinian state will be a peaceful one, that it will not become another terror base from which to threaten the well-being and the very existence of Israel, that we will have the ability to protect, peace and safety, the security, peace and safety, of all the citizens of Israel at all times. This is really huge, folks. It's like any moment. Daniel chapter 9. Did you read that passage? Recall what it said? He's going to make that covenant. We already read it before. Verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And remember, what is that covenant about? The context of the covenant is the Jews going back to their land and getting that temple and their ordinances restarting all over again. That's what that covenant is about. And God made that covenant with the Jews. But the Antichrist, the Antichrist, remember what I told you before? He's going to pretend to be that God and say, I made that covenant with you long ago, so I'm going to confirm it. That's why the word is not make the covenant, but confirm the covenant. Because the context of the covenant is the Jews getting back to their land and being able to reinstate their temple and Jewish practices again. If you look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 4, right? God made a covenant with those Jews. What is his covenant? You already know that uh, verse 12, verse 12, confirm the words, right? It's all about the fathers getting back into their land and the temple sacrifices. It's all over the, it's all over the Old Testament. You can look at verse 20 as well. It mentions about that. You can look at verse 24 as well. And verse 25. It's all over. It's all over. That's not the crazy part, believe it or not. Now, the crazy part. It's called Third Temple. I found that pretty interesting. Now, bear with me, okay? Uh, in order to see the devil's workings, obviously, Hollywood prophesies or show some things, right, about what the devil's going to do. There's a movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The one who directed the movie was a Jew. Is a Jew, excuse me, is a Jew. He's still alive, so Steven Spielberg. Now, it is very interesting when you look at that movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Now, I'm not encouraging Christians to watch it, but if you do happen to watch it or you did watch it before you got saved or when you got saved, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyways, between you and the Lord, how you do with movies. Anyways, going back to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I'm still lost. Yeah, still lost. Yeah. You lost your salvation when you watched it, right? And then you have to get it back again afterwards. <laughs> Anyways, uh, returning back to the main topic at hand, Steven Spielberg, when he did Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 
he actually had to get a, he actually got a letter from NASA, a 20 page letter from NASA telling him not to, to not to put out this movie. Believe it or not. Now, I'm looking at the liberal uh, source, Wikipedia, because it summarizes everything more easily. And actually, the original sources have been deleted and gone. Okay. They've been deleted and gone. You wonder why, right? But Wikipedia still retains it. They mention here, this is what Spielberg said. This is a famous quote he mentioned when he did his direct, uh, directing of the Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Let's see here. He mentions about NASA. Uh, so development filming. It's a long article here. Oh, I just lost that uh, quote he had. Anyways, I'll, ha uh, I'll, I'll pull it up while I'm looking for it. But in this quote, he mentioned that when he directed this movie, because NASA sent him a 20-page letter, in his mind, he's thinking... I'm on to something. Ah, uh, here it is. He said this. I really found my faith. That's what he said. I really found my faith. When I heard that the government was opposed to the film, if NASA took the time to write me a 20-page letter, then I knew there must be something happening. End of quote. If you watch that movie, it's crazy. Everything in it, you would see, wait, that matches with the Bible right there. That matches with the Bible. That matches all that crazy stuff Brother Kim already talked about. And why, how did this guy from what, 70s, I think that time, was able to pull up all these exact details accurately from what I showed you in the Bible a long time ago? You know why? He didn't just pull it out of thin air. He actually did it from a, with a guy who J. Allen Hynek, J. Allen Hynek, if you look up his life, he specialized in UFO research. And I'm not just talking about some UFO diehard fan. He was actually undertaken by the U.S. Air Force under the three big projects that had to do with UFO. Project Sign, Project Grudge, and Project Blue Book. He had uh, government access. He joined Professor Fred Whipple, the Harvard astronomer at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. And he had a lot of experience with that. The government pulled him up. If you look up his life, this ain't just your average Joe. Steven Spielberg consulted with him when he made the movie. And even though they claimed it as fiction. Hynek said that he was very surprised how much it matched all the details of his own account of, his, of the UFO studies and research. Strange stuff. He was the one who created that scale called the Hynek scale. Now you might say, what is the Hynek scale? That's where the title Close Encounters of the Third Kind came from. Close Encounters of the First Kind is visual sightings of an unidentified flying object, seemingly less than 500 feet away. Close Encounters of the Second Kind is a UFO event in which a physical effect is alleged. Interference in the functioning of a vehicle or electronic device, animals reacting, a physiological effect such as paralysis or heat and discomfort in the witness or some physical trace, like impressions in the ground, scorched or otherwise affected vegetation or a chemical trace. Close encounters of the third kind. Pastor, where you, you're talking about the third temple. Where are you getting at? Relax, relax, okay? Just follow along in this crazy journey with me, okay? Close encounters of the third kind. UFO encounters in which an animated entity is present these include humanoids, robots, and humans who seem to be occupants or pilots of a UFO. That's why it's called Close Encounter of the Third Kind. Now, if these are the three encounters, and that's what the movie demonstrated, 
and it showed the close encounter of the first kind where they claimed to see some kind of UFO flying by. It was crazy. You just see it go doo -doo 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 -doo, flying by. And then it, it showed the close encounter of the second kind where there's a guy in the vehicle and objects are moving all over. The electricity is popping out and uh, the lights flashing and stuff like that. Close encounter of the third kind is where they see that E.T. come home inside that vehicle. What does this have to do with the Temple Mount? If you recall my, probably my most crazy teaching, and you can watch that video, Georgia Guidestones, I mentioned to you that if the Antichrist is coming down and all these alien sightings are happening, they have to connect. There is a connection with the Temple Mount. There is a connection with the Third Temple. In what way? If that alien sighting is going to be shown and come down, he has to enter the temple. Yeah. That's the connection. And I sh showed you some documentation, so you can watch that video, that people claim that the Temple Mount was a strange place of alien sightings. Weird stuff. Muhammad, it was said, ascended up. Got just caught up to heaven that way, they say. The Muslims see it that way. Jewish sources believe that Jacob's ladder connected to heaven and that there's an encounter of celestial to human beings there. Some of the so-called Christians, I'll say so-called Christians, claim that Jesus Christ ascended from that Temple Mount when he went up to heaven. A lot of weird, crazy stuff there. And then you can watch that from the History Channel. If there's a connection to that, I'm like then when this third temple is built, they can get their third encounter. The close encounter of the third kind, right? Then I'm like, was there something with the second kind and the first kind with the second temple and first temple? Believe it or not, yeah. <laughs> Look at the book of Numbers 10. Here's your close encounter of the first kind. It's what? Seeing a UFO, right? All right, Numbers 10. Numbers 10. Now, this is the pre-temple era. Pre-temple era. Right before Solomon built his temple. Look at Numbers 10. You know who's in charge of carrying the Ark of the Covenant? Kohathites, okay? Look at Numbers chapter 10. And then verse 17. And the tabernacle was taken down, and the sons of Gershon and the sons of Merari set forward bearing the what? Tabernacle. If you look at verse 21, and the Kohathites set forward bearing the what? Sanctuary. Now that includes the Ark of the Covenant, and you can look at Numbers chapter 3, verse 31 it, for cross reference, all right? But I'm not going to do that. But. Look what's going on with this ark. It's flying ahead of them. It's not with them, all right? It's flying ahead of them. Why? Because the Kohathites have all the temple materials with them. And remember right here, they're, they're in this line here. If you look at the, the sequence of the line, verse 14, in the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah according to their armies. See that? Then in verse 21, the Kohathites are somewhere there in the middle. So the ark should be in the middle, right? All of a sudden, look at this, verse 33. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord. What's God's command with the Kohathites? They're supposed to be in the middle, bearing that, right? So the ark should be in the middle. But look at this, went before them in the three days journey to search out a resting place for them. One, well, the world, the Ark of the Covenant's ahead of them and it's searching out a place for them to rest. Well, the Kohathites are in front of them and carrying the Ark. No, no. If you look at the previous verses, they're supposed to be in the middle and God made a strict. No one else is supposed to carry the Ark. That thing is flying. It's going ahead of them. But Keep reading. Look at verse 35. And it came to pass when the ark set forward. See, read it literally as it says. The ark is going forward. That Moses said, Rise up, Lord, 
and let thine enemies be scattered. See, that, that, that's what Moses taught to the, uh, when Moses was talking to the Ark of the Covenant, it went, whoop, it was rising up like that. Why? Because God was sitting, for some of you who know this about the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord sits in between the cherubims at times at the Ark of the Covenant. It's flying, it's flying. What, what does that have to do with Solomon's temple? Because this flying UFO Ark, we see this UFO, it's called a UFO, right? The Ark? So we can agree that's a UFO. Notice it entered inside Solomon's temple now. They carried it to Solomon's temple. There's your encount close encounter of the first kind. Go to 1 Kings now. 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Book of 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings chapter 7. Notice they carried the UFO inside Solomon's temple. 1 Kings Chapter 8, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 6, chapter 8, verse 6. They're bringing this inside Solomon's temple. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims. So they're bringing it inside Solomon's temple. All right, close encounter of the second kind. F physical phenomena. There's supposed to be a physical phenomena everywhere. That's close encounter of the second kind, right? Did that happen with the second temple? Yes, Matthew 27. Matthew 27. The veil got torn. And the earthquake, there was an earthquake. There was physical phenomena everywhere. Look at Matthew. Chapter 27. Here's your close encounter of the second kind. Wait till you, we hit third, fourth, and fifth. It's going to get wilder and wilder, wilder. Matthew chapter 27. The Bible says in verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple, the second temple, was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. This is quite a physical phenomena, verse 52, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now that is no doubt a second kind phenomena right there. Close encounter of the second kind. Close encounter... Here we go, of the third kind. Let's start out with the basic. 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You see some kind of being inside the UFO object. They do meet the alien. They do see the alien. In the third temple, the Antichrist... That being who is not of this world, that demonic being, they're going to see him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We already read this verse before. Verse 3, the son of perdition, that's the Antichrist, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing that he is God. Notice, showing himself that he is God. They see him. They see him. But here's the interesting thing here. Go to Revelation 11 about this third temple. Go to Revelation 11. There's something weird here. This was a little mysterious to me. I did verse by verse on Revelation and it didn't really dawn on me until I read this. Look at Revelation chapter 11. The Bible reads in verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles 
and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. This is important, okay? The court of the temple, without the temple, the Bible says it's given to the Gentiles. They're going to tread it underfoot forty and two months. Now that's the timeline of the tribulation, okay? During the timeline of the tribulation, the Gentiles, they're going to trot it underfoot. Did you hear that? Trot it underfoot. That means it's destroyed right there. It's destroyed. Trod underfoot. So basically, how can you have a temple then, right? If it's trod underfoot? Here's another one. Go to Daniel 9. Did you read that again? Daniel 9 again. Daniel 9 again. Read verse 27 again. Daniel 9, 27 again. Read this. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He's stopping it as if it's non-existent now or destroyed. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it what? Desolate. That's empty. So it doesn't exist. Even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. It's even more so with Luke 21. Go to Luke 21. This is literal in Luke 21. This is literal in Luke 21. It's talking about Rome. And when Rome conquers the second temple, they literally trod it underfoot and it's non-existent. We do know that in history. But Jesus prophesied that. Luke chapter 21. He says in verse 24, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Did you see that? So he's talking about the Romans trotting underfoot the temple. But this is the tribulation, 25, 26, 27, 28. That's the tribulation. Uh, verse, let's see right here. If you look at verse mm, 9, if you look at verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, that matches with Matthew 24, the tribulation. But even more so, it is literally trodden down underfoot because Jesus said at verse 6, he's talking about the temple at verse 5, right? Verse 5, that second temple. He said in verse 6, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come, in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, we got something, we got a puzzle here. It says it'll be trodden underfoot 40 and two months. That's the tribulation timeline. But then Luke 21, verse 24, it says trodden down of the Gentiles until what? The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You know what that time, you know what God's looking at? He's looking at not just tribulation. He's looking at Rome and tribulation. So follow along with me, okay? This is, that's how I can build up the, the crazy thought, okay? Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That don't finish until Jesus comes down here on earth and reigns as King of kings, Lord of lords. The past 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years, is known as the times of the Gentiles. So Jesus said, when Rome trods it underfoot, then it's going to keep going down that way. They're going to keep trotting it until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The tribulation, it continues that. That means the temple, you know what that means? This is, this is something to think about. Then that means that temple that the Jews want to build, that third temple, it may be, let me build up one by one, okay? That way you can follow along with me. First of all, in the temple mount, there are people who say this. If that third temple has to be built on that temple mount, because the Muslims already have their two buildings over there, some of them are arguing you can't squeeze in a third temple. Literally, Bible prophecy is fulfilled. The, the Jewish temple is trodden underfoot of the Gentiles. Those Muslims, they're trodden it underfoot. As a matter of fact, if you look up that Messianic Bible 
project website, like I mentioned, the Arabs and those Muslims, what they're doing is they're trying to take away any remains of the second temple that exists. They're literally like trotting it underfoot. What does that mean? This can mean this, which is kind of crazy, all right? And that's why I say crazy. First of all, we have to understand, won't Satan, isn't Satan's character to imitate Jesus Christ? All right, that's what he's going to do. Let me show you Revelation chapter 20. Let's go here, Revelation 20. Revelation chapter 20. Here's where I'm getting at. Uh, Revelation 21, uh, Revelation 21. There is a flying city called New Jerusalem. The Bible shows right here in verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Look at this flying city that comes out of nowhere. But what does the Bible call this? That's his temple. Look at verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Look at verse 22. 22. And I saw no temple therein. Why? For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. New Jerusalem right here. With its temple, it's actually flying. It's a flying temple temple, not on the ground. What if the Antichrist temple is not on that ground, but flying on top of it? Now, if you look at, look at these two crazy drawings here. If you look at Close Encounters of the Third Kind, my mind went wild. Doesn't this look, doesn't that flying saucer look similar to New Jerusalem like a up and down city. Do Dr. Roman drew New Jerusalem as an upside, like a, a pyramid like this and like this, like both sides, the city. If you look at that, that's so weird. I don't know why Spielberg did that. If you look at that flying saucer, it's like cities up and below it. Yeah. That is nuts. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Oh, by the way, in this temple, guess what? People are going inside it, the Bible says. All the nations gather around the world and they go inside it. You know, Steven Spielberg's film shows when that flying saucer came down and it was flying like that, there were people who were dressed up in astronaut uniforms and then some priest, Catholic, reading the Bible, saying, God bless you in your journey as you enter into the kingdom. And all these people line up and they go inside New Jerusalem. That is wild. Look at Revelation 21, verse 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. What makes you think now, if God's going to do that with his temple, bring all the United Nations inside there that the, the Antichrist don't want to do the same thing. Isn't that wild? That's pretty wild right there. Close encounter of the third kind. They see the alien in that UFO. And that UFO could be that temple... That's flying. Now, when God sets up his temple in the millennium, you know what's going to be? On top of a mount. Okay, go to Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2. You know what's crazy about that movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? When that temple, quote unquote, so to speak, or that UFO came down, they were sending a message to the people who had contact with the aliens or the aliens trying to give them a message. And they all had an infatuation and they were saying, it's a mount, it's a mount. The, al the, the alien UFO ship is gonna be on a mount, but where is that mount at? 
God says the mount of the Lord is where it's going to be his temple, the mount of the Lord. But isn't it coinky dinky? It's so strange that the aliens, when they land their quote unquote temple on the mount, it's called not mount of the Lord, but devil's tower, like tower of Babel and devil. Isn't that weird? This, when I saw that movie, this is, I'm like, this is, this ain't just normal. I don't see it as normal directing. A lot of things is, what I see is pretty deliberate. And even if the director or the people in charge didn't do it deliberately, I see a spirit that's doing this very deliberately. Especially if Hynek said a lot of the things that Spielberg did matched up with his UFO research. It's following that spirit then. That's weird. That's weird. Why would it be on the devil's tower, right? The devil's tower, or that ship would be. Isaiah chapter 2. Why on a mountain? Why make a big deal about that? It's just too weird. Isaiah 2, verse 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the J God of Jacob. How about that? How about that? There's just too many weird stuff here. So then some similarities is that it's going to be on the mount of the Lord, New Jerusalem. This one, they said, is Devil's Tower. Why, if you want to, uh, wouldn't that be a perfect name for the Tower of Babel? Mm -hmm. They were going to uh, start the Antichrist kingdom right then and there at that time. Here's another one. Is we see Flying City matching with the Close Encounter movie. It's weird. Okay. Why do you have fourth encounter, fifth encounter? So actually, they want Heineck scale can go beyond that. But uh, it has not been proposed by Heineck himself. There are other people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. And because of that, they had to put, they added two scales for Heineck. And they put, uh, the high, uh, they put close encounter of the fourth kind and they put forth uh, the close encounter of the fifth kind. And you might say, what is the fourth kind? The fourth kind is where you are abducted by the alien. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Fourth encounter is abduction. Now, isn't the, Lord, isn't, uh, isn't the rapture, we're going to be abducted, we're going to be stolen away like a thief in the night God's going to come down and steal us snatch us up you know what rapture means rapture means snatching to take away Ab uh, so we see uh, alien abduction I'll add that that's what the movie would call it but the Bible calls it rapture it calls it rapture now the devil has an explanation once the uh, Christians get raptured up to heaven, now the, uh, he's got an explanation. How this happened is because of those alien things that we've talked to you about, that the Pentagon has told you about. So they've been abducted. It's all preparing for the Antichrist, guys. Uh, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the Bible shows that uh, when the Lord gives his sound of the... Yep, the trump, then we're going to rise up and be together with him. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Close encounter of the fifth kind. What is the fifth kind? Actual communication with the alien. Uh, there's a movie called The Fourth Kind, and people have said that it's based...
based on total fiction and even though the movie claimed to be real life events, I'm not too sure about it, but it was very freaky where the ending part of the movie, the person who supposedly got abducted by an alien, when the psychologist used hypnosis so that the person can uh, uh, give back the memories, the person recalled the memory of being abducted by the alien and the alien was speaking in some kind of weird Tower of Babel language, Sumerian language, and proclaiming himself to be God, I am God. So supposedly that's what she communicated with that alien when she was abducted. But the thing is, uh, that's how the movie summary or the plot goes. And then some people, there were some shady things going on. It's just too much there. But it happened in, I think, Nome, Alaska. I think that's the name of the location there. But then close encounter of the fifth kind is actual communication. If you study a lot of the people who claim to be abducted by aliens, this is the weird stuff. When I researched about alien abductions and people who were eyewitnesses, remember that, eyewitnesses of the alien abduction, skeptics try to dismiss it as a hallucination. Remember that. I'm going to connect something here. But then these people, they found out they were sane. They were not psychologically crazy. They, had, uh, they don't have abstract patterns of memory. It looked like it was uh, in sequence or in order. And for some weird reason, they all share the same they discuss about different accounts, even though they're totally different people without any relationship whatsoever. And they believe this so strongly, these eyewitnesses, that they would witness and talk about it. It's another strange thing about these witnesses, and the movie kind of shows it with Close Encounters of the Third Kind. When there's a contact with an alien, they feel compelled or drawn. And it's such a convincing witness that the main character is willing to sacrifice his whole family for that. And he lost his whole family just because he wants to testify or witness about this alien. Now, you know what I'm getting at right here? Are you getting it so far? There's only, this is hard to debunk scientifically, but there's another second thing it's hard to debunk scientifically. The eyewitnesses yeah. of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Why? Because it's a real event that happened. Skeptics try to dismiss it as a hallucination. However, they have a hard time dismissing it as a hallucination because these people were not crazy. They didn't have abstract memory patterns. They were sane. Some of them were skeptics, actually, yeah. in the Bible. But they convinced, they were very convinced this witness is true that they were willing to sacrifice their own families for the sake of testifying that this witness, I've encountered this alien. Excuse me, I've encountered Jesus Christ and I know he's real. But the devil wants to copycat that. Do you know why people are big into this vision stuff? A lot of these people who had these alien abductions or people who had contact with the aliens, they have these weird visions and they feel compelled and drawn and nothing can shake off this feeling that this witness is true. That's dangerous stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And people are proclaiming that right now that I had a contact with Jesus and I know this witness is true. There's something there, believe it or not. This is what I believe. There's something about an encounter with a heavenly being that gives some kind of convincing aura. Drawn aura. It's so weird. Look at how John would describe it with his encounter. Not with those demonic aliens, but with Jesus Christ. Look at uh, John. Chapter 1. John chapter 1. Notice uh, this quote-unquote alien coming down and landing on the earth. But it ain't no alien, it's Jesus Christ. Look at uh, verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. See, Jesus, who lived up in heaven, came down here on earth. 
lived with humans, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They are drawn to him. You'll notice that at verse, uh, look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. They saw him. They handled him. They touched him. That's some contact. Look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Look at uh, verse 24. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote of these things. After he handled, he touched him, right? And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's close it off here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at his resurrection. There's something about that glory or that aura that comes out. And then it drives a convincing power to the people. It makes them drawn to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. After that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that he was seen of five, above five hundred brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James and of all the apostles. Now look at verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of who? Me also. This was a guy who was a diehard anti-resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he had an encounter, the fifth kind, with some beam and light that shot out of the sky and shot right at him and blinded him and then talked to him. And he was convinced that witness is true with his vision, with that Jesus. His name is Jesus. And so he was willing to die for that. Isn't it strange, son, these people who encounter the aliens have that some kind of strange conviction? It's so dangerous that I said this was the last verse. I lied. Second Thessalonians 2. This is the last verse. It's a strong delusion. Because they have the encounter of the fifth kind. And it's something about that power that draws them. That's why they will worship Satan. You know why? Because one, there's something about a celestial being which explains why I'm just throwing in all, so many things that you can connect dots with. But that would probably make sense why Eve was drawn. And the Bible says the serpent beguiled as if it's like charmed Eve. Like she was drawn. How, how does she end? I mean, the serpent was at that tree. How does she end up there? Something was calling her, maybe. Like these, like these so-called alien witnesses who had their encounter, and then they felt drawn to go back to their place where they were called out by the aliens. Weird. Weird. That would make sense why the sons of God were able to intermingle with the humans. Why? And the women were able to intermarry with them. Why? Daniel chapter 2, they're able to intermarry with them. Why? Revelation chapter 13, the dragon flying up in the heavens, but the whole world worships and honors him when he comes down. Why? There's something about it that draws them. Something's calling them. Something's calling them. It's the same thing like the Holy Spirit that calls you. It's the same thing that the word, what we have is the word of God and the inward witness of the spirit. Those are the two things that are calling us. And let's be honest, when that word of God is preached, something is drawing you. When the Holy Spirit is convicting you, something is drawing you. This is, this, make, I'm, you're connecting a lot of dots, dots after that. You can connect a lot of dots after that. Who's to say Satan doesn't have that same power? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after. When he comes, when the alien lands, is coming after the working of Satan with all power 
and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion and they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I should have said Revelation 13 is my last verse, but I'm, not, I'm going to keep my promise, okay? But if you look at Revelation 13, 3 and 4, is it interesting? Let me close it right here. Our power that draws us is when, we, when the apostles encountered the fifth kind when Christ resurrected. The world will encounter their fifth kind when the Antichrist gets resurrected. And they will be eyewitnesses of his resurrection and they will be willing to die for a Christ like that. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching has definitely blown our minds and made us see how demonic and how, uh, how strange that being, that devil is, that uh, his working is real, Father. And that we shouldn't be caught up in his temptation, Lord. I mean, if he unleashed his full power of temptation on us, we would have died a long time ago, Lord. Father, the only thing that's preventing us from being drawn from an evil spirit is the clean spirit, the Holy Spirit. Help us to yield to that more than the unclean. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.